history? Welcome, everyone, to an evening with David Rose at Southern New Hampshire University. My name is Mary Lane, and on behalf of the Department of Education, Bureau of Special Education, and the Office of Student Wellness, I thank you. We thank you for coming out this evening. So as I was coming down from Concord, I'm thinking, what are the opening remarks that would make it on a beautiful evening in June? And then I thought about a New England poet, David Russell Lowell, who said, what is so rare as a day in June? In fact, one that is perfect, and what couldn't be topped off than an evening with David Rose? So I'm just gonna go through tonight's events. We're gonna hear from David Rose about universal design for learning, both on the national and international level. And then, working with us from Fall Mountain District, we're gonna talk about what's happening in the Vilas Middle School with regards to the New Hampshire Universal Design for Learning Academy. So think of this as opening events of us sharing how the state is working with school districts and communities about implementing universal design for learning. I'm gonna move over here because now it's time for me to talk about David Rose. So David is what we call a developmental neuropsychologist. And David, actually, is the founder of the Center for Applied Special Technologies, located in Wakefield, Massachusetts, whose mission is to really look at the upcoming innovation of technology and blending it with the science of cognitive learning. David is an author of several books, one in particular, Universal Design for Learning in Theory and Practice. David lives in Cambridge, and he also has a home in New Hampshire at Lake Winnipesaukee. David has been awarded several Distinguished Educator Awards, one being the most recent from the Council for Exceptional Children, where it's a Lifetime Achievement Award. So again, I wanna thank everyone. This again is an online event, and you know that more and more of us are participating in various ways virtually and face-to-face. -face. With that, I introduce Dr. David Rose. Thanks. Um, I wanna correct Mary right away. Uh, don't uh, live on Lake Winnipesaukee, because that's kind of high-end. Uh, we live on the Smith River, which is a tiny little river. Uh, but anyway, it's great. So uh, I was happy to uh, come up here because Mary and I have been teasing each other for years about this. So I'm finally a New Hampshire resident and pay taxes and all those things. So I feel legit to be here now. Um, and uh, I'm glad to do it. And thanks for having me. So uh, I'm going to do some sort of uh, theory and background on UDL, and Greg's going to take it much closer to the grain of uh, individual classrooms. And we've never talked uh, as a pair before, so this will be a great opportunity. And John is also speaking, as I understand. So John uh, and Greg will, if you are bored with me, don't assume they'll be as boring. They will be uh, different quite a bit. Okay, but may ask me to give the sort of background and some of you, how many people feel they know a reasonable amount about universal design for learning? Only a couple, but how many people are really, this is the first time they'll be hearing about UDL? Okay, most people, um, great. And uh, so I've prepared a talk that is mostly for novices and there'll be a couple places where I'll bring up some new stuff. Um, now you guys that are way over there, can you see and hear and everything? Okay, 
I always, I always know people are sitting way over there to try to escape me if it's really bad, um, and that'll be fine. Uh, okay, so uh, first, where did UDL come from? And uh, I've recently uh, unearthed a video of the, if there's any moment when UDL began, this is it, this isn't what UDL does now, um, but this is uh, Ann Meyer, one of the founders, uh, co-founders of CAST, and she's working with a little guy whose name is Matthew. And uh, we were neuropsychologists at Children's Hospital. And our job was to evaluate kids and give them uh, recommendations for their IEPs. But Matthew came in as an extreme case. Uh, and his mother brought him in because he was going to go to an institutional school. He had profound physical disabilities. He couldn't move any of his voluntary muscles except his chin and his eyes. He can open and close his eyes and move his eyes, but he couldn't move his arms, his legs, uh, he couldn't hold himself up. You'll see he's held up with a brace. Um, and the school assumed he was profoundly retarded, as people used to say, uh, and he was going to be institutionalized. And his mother just didn't believe it. So she brought him in because we were new at looking at how to use technology as part of our recommendations uh, from the neuropsych clinic. So. Ann Meyer has, for the first time, we had to fashion a switch. Greg and John will think this is, looks really, uh, really, really old and awful. Okay, but I just want to be clear, there weren't switches in those days, so we had to make it. Um, and uh, she's holding it up under his chin because we wanted to know, could we teach him, because his chin worked fine, could we teach him Morse code so that we could communicate with him? Because he had no way to communicate. He doesn't. You know, he really has incredibly limited. So Anne is holding this switch we just made to see if she can teach him to just be able to click uh, twice in a row so that then we know he could do it. All right, so here's, it's just only a minute. Uh, what? Just worked a minute ago. I will, oh God, I really want to show that. So I'm going to come back to that because I don't, Ah. I don't know what happened. Well, technically, I wonder why did did anything go wrong with all my videos? I hope not. Uh, okay, I have another way to get to it. I just don't want to pull out of my uh, PowerPoint. So here's what happens. Uh, she's holding it under his chin, and it's hard. He's going like this, and he can't quite get it, and he can't get two in a row. Uh, but you can tell he's trying, and then all of a sudden, he finally goes, and he gets, and that's a, whatever letter it was, an E. And then there's just an explosion of joy on his face as for the first time he actually communicated to someone. And Anne, what I like about the video, Anne and he both tear up. I love it because Anne's a great teacher. So both student and teacher cried because this is an emotional moment. And uh, we'll talk about engagement and all of that. But anyway, it's a, it's a fabulous moment that I hadn't seen in 30 years. So this is how we started with really hard kids. Um, and I think probably everybody here knows the um, uh, idea of universal design. That's Ron Mace who started the idea. Um, the idea was uh, how do we get around the barriers that people face uh, getting into buildings? And uh, one solution is to retrofit, to add ramps onto the building. and um, that doesn't work very well. Matthew's school was like that. This is Matthew's school, and he, it ends up he has to go in the back of the building. The ramp wasn't well designed for him, so he couldn't use, oh, we taught him to use his chin to drive his wheelchair. So once we had, he could drive his wheelchair with his chin, we wanted him to go to school, but then the ramp was just not built right, and it was very expensive for the school to put it on, but they didn't do it well and all that, so he still seemed shut out of school at first. Um, Universal design is the idea, build the building right when you start. Um, so we can, I also should say, look how ugly it is. It's not aesthetically good. It's very expensive to do it and all that. But if you design from the beginning, um, uh, st stairs, ramps combined in various ways, you can make it both beautiful and so that people who are uh, disabled like Matthew can use it, but also people who have wheelchairs and, I'm um, sorry, who have, um, 
um, any kind of roll device, their luggage, uh, their baby carriages, their strollers, all of those things can now go in the building. It's just a better designed building for everybody. And you don't have to think about, what am I going to do when Matthew comes? The building is already designed well. So that's the idea of universal design. What is universal design for learning? Um, it's a framework for thinking about what are the issues that one would want to make sure are designed into our learning environments, our schools, our classrooms, the kind of ways we teach. And we're going to talk a little bit about them. First, I want to jump to the end. If, that was, if Matthew was the beginning, where is UDL now? Uh, and it's in lots of places. So I just, this is just to say it's not a crackpot um, notion of, of people who live down the road from you uh, only. Uh, so UDL is written into the uh, Elementary and Secondary Act. The, um, what's the name of it, Mary? Uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA 2016. UDL's in it seven times. Uh, it's in textbooks now, education textbooks. This is teaching in today's inclusive classrooms. A universal design for learning approach and virtually every textbook that talks about special needs kids now talks about UDL. Um, I was just, as Mary said, at the Council for Exceptional Children, and there were 35 talks about UDL. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education is very much behind UDL. They put out an ed tech developer's guide for people who are going to develop educational technologies, and they say, you should do UDL. Um, there are companies who are now formed around doing UDL, so this is uh, it's Learning. Does anyone in New Hampshire use It's Learning? It's a platform, pretty fairly popular. Uh, so they're just an example, and they say, we're a universal design for learning company. Um, universal design for learning is now in higher education, um, and uh, colleges and universities are actually pushed to, um, uh, to approach universal design for learning by the Higher Education Act that came out and said, you should be doing UDL. UDLs in other countries. I've just come back from Lithuania. I'm going to Italy. Um, the countries, uh, this is Ireland, but countries all over the world are now adopting UDLs part of their practices. And I just want to highlight a really neat article that just came out um, in the Harvard Education Review, which looks at how does UDL cross rough with culturally responsive education? And the authors are saying, these two things go together really well, and the people who do UDL should do culturally responsive education, and the people who do culturally responsive education should do UDL. It's a nice article and uh, very powerful. Um, PBS is now uh, has a huge um, uh, project on uh, early learning, which has as one of its foundational uh, principles doing UDL. We're working with them on that, and of course, New Hampshire. That's why we're here. New Hampshire is doing UDL, and we're hoping you are going to be a real uh, spotlight uh, state. Um, and uh, Mary's been a longtime advocate, and other people here I know have been very much key leaders in the Universal Design for Learning movement. But New Hampshire adopting it as a statewide basis is a big deal. It's, it's great, and there'll be more of them coming. Uh, UDL is written into the, the postings for uh, state improvement plans. So congratulations to you for starting out early. Um, okay, now I want to just talk to, take the three words and talk about what do we mean by universal, what do we mean by design, and what do we mean by learning. So by universal we mean everybody. People often think that uh, UDL is about kids with disabilities, but that's not a good view of it. It's more like that, how do you make a great entrance to a school for everybody, people in strollers, baby carriages, as well as people like Matthew. So it's not about disability, it's about um, diversity. And UDL is about moving from a disability focus to the fact that we are very diverse as a population. And how do we meet the challenge of diversity rather than make things special for kids who have disabilities? So let me just uh, go a little bit deeper on that. The old view of uh, what diversity looked like is, and you all have had some form of this, the IQ distribution. There's one thing that is really important about the difference between kids, something you measure on IQ tests. The new views are much more informed um, by the modern neuroscientists to say, wow, that's not really... For one thing, neuroscientists almost never talk about IQ. They find it a curious and odd um, idea that you could capture 
the range of individual differences with something like an IQ. Um, so it's a particularly narrow view, and the neuroscientists, uh, they almost never mention IQ. They're just like, what? What would IQ look like? Instead, what they find is the following, which is, look how different these four human brains look. They just really are structured very differently. And they have commonalities, but also very significant individual differences. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Here's another example just of uh, some tracks that go front to back. People always focus on right brain, left brain, but actually front brain, back brain is a much more important uh, dimension. So anyway, here show, wow, people are really different in their front brain to back brain connections. Uh, they, we don't look the same. Uh, and here's uh, an example of another way to look at it. Beginning golfers have very different brains than expert golfers. So all of that practice you did actually changed your brain. Uh, when you practice violin or golf or anything like that, you actually are shaping your brain to be a different kind of brain. And that's sort of the new neuroscience is saying, whoa, it's not fixed. Um, it's not one size at all. It's very variable. It's variable by genetics. How did you come into this world? And it's varied by environment. What happened to you? Trauma is resident, changes your brain. So does... Uh, rewards from your mother. When she says, I love you, it changes your brain. Okay, there are three major networks that we're gonna just highlight a little bit. Um, and they're just the big divisions of the brain. And uh, let me just talk about what they are. In the back of your brain, there are all the parts that take information in from the outside world. Don't worry about taking notes or stuff. Mary can give you these slides later. Um, the uh, back part of your brain, so if you have a, if one of your friends has a bullet hole through the back of their brain, you'll be able to predict they're going to have some trouble identifying things in their environment, knowing things like that, okay? So it, the back part of your brain allows you to identify, interpret patterns of sensation. Things come in your eyes, your ears, your nose, your throat. Uh, all that information is analyzed by this posterior, the back part of your brain, to say, what is that? What was that thing? Could be an odor, could be a picture, could be anything like that. Back part of your brain does that. Front part of your brain does a very different thing. The front part of your brain allows you to plan, execute, and, and monitor your actions. So it's the motor part, but it's more than that. It not only allows you to move, but it allows you to move strategically and to make skillful movements. That's why we have so much of our cortex devoted to that. We're not like much lower animals that just have a few fixed movements we make. We have ways of thinking strategically ahead. What kind of things should I do next is what the front part of your brain does for you. And the last part, and uh, John and Greg and I were talking about this beforehand, that um, in many ways, the most important part of your brain has been the hardest to study. So neuroscientists didn't pick up on it um, as the central thing until more recently. And that is the part of your brain that's at the middle. You notice these other ones are on the outside surface. But the part on the middle of your brain is the part that allows you to evaluate and set priorities for things like attention. What's important? Of all the things that are coming in from your sensory information, what should you pay attention to? What should you spend more time processing? And similarly, motorly, what should you, what should you do? What are the things you should do that are most important rather than just randomly make movements? So those parts of the brain are in the center of your brain. And I will argue, and uh, probably John and Greg too, these are the parts that are most important to teachers. We are people who do emotional work. Our job is to get kids engaged, engaged in lifelong learning. And that means we have to think about their emotional affective differences. And they are different here as in these other ways. But engagement, and I like to say, and some of you may have heard me in other talks, that teaching is first and foremost emotional work. Think of all the movies you've ever seen about teaching. None of them are about how to do long division or geometry. All of them are about teachers who motivated their students. 
I'm trying to think, what are the Goodwill Hunting? Uh, what are some of the other classic movies? What? To Serve with Love. What's another one? Yes, Mr. Holland's Hope is a great one. What is that about? They're all about people who can motivate their students to learn. So they're going after this part of the nervous system. If you can get this part engaged, the other stuff is far easier, far easier. So we start there in the UDL guidelines, as we'll see. Um, and I'm going to be, I have to keep clicking on my phone a little bit just to, well, that's not going to work, but uh, it, I, I, it's, isn't it amazing? There's no clock in this room, so I can't tell. Um, anyway, um, so the back part, I just want to say, uh, tell a story about it, okay? Um, and I want to explore uh, that little part there that's pink. Um, that's part of this back half of the brain where you recognize things. But this is auditory cortex. And my wife and I are quite different in that. So here's Ruth. And her auditory cortex allows her to have perfect pitch. Does anybody here have perfect pitch? Wow, Mary. We need better selection. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, perfect pitch, I think you probably know what it means. It means that any note anyone plays or sings or anything, Ruth knows that's a B flat or that's a C sharp. And it's not like it's hard for her. She doesn't have to hum to herself or do anything like that. It's just like you recognizing orange. When you play a note, she goes, that's a B flat. Not hard. So she has perfect pitch. I'm different than that, okay? So I'm like apparently most of you. I don't have perfect pitch. I know that a note is high. I can tell what one's higher than another, but I don't know what it is if you just play the note. I don't know that's a, a B flat. And uh, that's the difference between perfect pitch and relative pitch. Um, there's the recent neuroscience tells us something about how does this work? So here's actually what it looks like. The brain on the top, this is the same parts of the brain. You'll notice the yellow part that is the kind of cortex apparently you have, which is there's thin amount of connections here. The connections in your auditory course are like a country road up in uh, northern New Hampshire. You know, one lane road, maybe two, but not a very fast road. The bottom one is people who have major four lane highways in that same part of their auditory cortex. Can you see the difference in how thick those those two parts of the brain are. Notice it's only on the left side. That's the, where the yellow is. On the right side of the brain, they're actually identical. So having perfect pitch, we know it's something about the way this brain is structured that differs between Ruth and I. She has what's called, she is hyper-connected, and it's asymmetric. It's just on her left side of her brain. She has this unusual connectivity really a thick thoroughfare that connects that part of her brain to, each, to itself. Um, so there's where ours look. Ruth is on the right, her brain looks like that, my brain looks like that. That's an individual difference of the kind we can now study. So the question I would pose to you is, who has a disability? These are really different brains. Who has a disability? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on the environment, not on our brains. So um, just to fill this out a little bit, um, Ruth is a semi-professional singer, sings in places like Boston Symphony Hall. Great singer. Why? Because she has this fabulous pitch um, capacity, and she's spent a lot of her life studying and singing music, and she's really good at it. So it's nice, thickly connected cortex. And for her, when we got married 47 years ago, uh, she, of course, was incredibly disappointed in my kind of brain because she viewed marriage as much like the movie Sound of Music, that she would marry some really handsome guy and uh, that they would raise children who sang in six or eight part harmony. So it was after our marriage that she realized that I wasn't going to be raising children like that if I passed on my genes to our children, and I did. So to Ruth, she has a whole family that's disabled. That is, pitch is really easy to her. She can sing easily. She knows what she's doing. And she has a husband and two children 
who are disabled. Uh, and that's the way she sees it. And so she's great disappointment of her life is we can't sing in our Volkswagen van together. <laughs> but, and this is a true story, um, there are contexts where things are quite different. One of them is the church we both go to. In our church, an old, old New England church, um, Ruth is sitting there in the church and the people around her are all like me and you. You're not actually singing quite on pitch, all right? And worse, that our organ is 100 years old, so it is actually not playing. When you press the G key, it's actually playing on F flat or something. It's a whole step and a half below. So here's Ruth looking at the hymn book and she knows exactly what to sing except not a soul in the whole church is singing that note. And everybody's kind of messy even around the one they're singing. They're not like, so what does Ruth do? Ruth mumbles quietly because she doesn't know what to do. Do I sing the note or do I sing what all these crazy disabled people are singing? So I love it that the, in our church, because I only go once a week, people see me as a good singer and I get asked to join the choir every year. And here's Ruth, a professional singer, and they don't even know because she doesn't look like she likes to sing or can she do whatever, because our church rewards relative pitch, not perfect pitch. It's way better to have relative pitch in our church because then you can sing and enjoy it and it doesn't get in your way. And some of you will hear this later, but um, people with perfect pitch often describe it as their disability because they go to rock concerts and the people aren't singing on pitch. Um, they have trouble singing along in groups because of the same reason, blah, blah, blah. So it's actually a disability to them as well as an incredible ability. So disabilities feel like that. They are something that is resident not in us, but in our um, exchange with the environment. What are the environment asking for? If it's symphony hall, then Ruth is great and I feel disabled. If it's our church, I feel great and Ruth is disabled. That's the way disability often looks. So I just want to show you one recent piece of research that came out that I love, which is looked at how are this, this connections that I was talking about, how did that look in uh, children with autism? And this is just a recreation that uh, Science Magazine did, but You'll notice on the right, children with autism have that sort of super highway of connections, way more connected than your brain is and than other children are. Now that's not the way we thought of autism. People have forever thought of autism as having some kind of brain damage. There's a hole in their head of some kind. They've got a real sharp disability. But in fact, their brains in lots of places are like Ruth's. They have, in fact, I should say to prove the point, Kids with autism have a much higher incidence of perfect pitch. They have brains that are going to be good at things like pitch. Recognizing uh, perceptually, they're really strong, have great memories, all sorts of things they're really good at. And just like my example with Ruth, they have things they're really bad at. Um, and that goes with what kind of a nervous system do they have? It, and, Learners with autism are hyper-connected, just like Ruth is, except in large amounts of pain. That's why I, I, some of you probably work with kids with autism or have them in your classrooms. That's why they feel overwhelmed by stimuli, because they have such rich connections that just little noises, and certainly a lot of things, are too much. So they're looking to make a stereotopy to, how can I reduce the amount of stimulation that's coming into my brain right now? It's too much. and that's. Uh, that's a very different view of them, though, than viewing them as having some big hole in their head, okay? So um, that's what we are learning about individual differences. A lot of them feel like that. And UDL uh, offers a look at those three parts of the brain. I'm only going to be able to do one today. Um, and provides what are the kinds of things you can do in a learning environment to meet the challenge of kids that are as different as kids with autism or as different as Ruth and so on. And uh, we'll do a little bit of this, but I can't go very deeply into it, but there's three things, three principles. One is the first one is about engagement. How can we engage all our students when in fact they're really very different? 
Autistic kids are engaged in very different ways than kids who have ADHD. That's why it can be infuriating. Kids with ADHD are at the opposite end of the stimulation spectrum. They need more stimulation. They're mostly bored. And so if you don't give them enough stimulation, they start acting out. We need more stuff happening here. Whereas kids with autism are saying, oh my God, there's too much stimulation in this classroom. I need to try to uh, reduce it. I need to do my regular stereotypies and so on. Um, so engagement is a thing on which we differ. But so is the second principle, sorry my button doesn't seem to go that far, um, is how do we present information to kids? Kids are really different. Kids can be blind, kids can be deaf, kids can be dyslexic. There's all kinds of differences in the ways in which they take information in. And lastly, kids can be very different in the ways in which they can act on the world. Everything from kids who have a physical disability like Matthew um, to uh, kids who have uh, ADHD executive function disabilities. Okay, and this is just to show you how that works. We looked at the brain to say, what are the things you'd need to pay attention to? So the arrow shows you where physical actions, this is where Matthew had his problem, just in the physical action. But once we gave him a switch, he could do high level cognition. He's now graduated from college. From being in a kid who was gonna to go to a profoundly disabled institution, he graduates college. Why? Because we gave him an alternative for physical action. He could use his switch to, to spell, to write, and to drive his wheelchair. So we can get around physical action. Skills and fluency is a little bit forward of that, not just simple movements, but how can you shoot a basket? How can you write? Um, how can you dance? And lastly, in the very front of your brain, individual differences in executive functions. How, how can you plan and be strategic about the things you're gonna do? All of those are things in which kids are gonna differ. So Matthew, as I said, physical. Me, I'm gonna skip this story, but I used to tell a story of uh, me learning in dance class, which definitely hits into my area of disability. So I was humiliated by being a poor dancer. Um, and this is when I was a Harvard professor, you know, when you feel very vulnerable to people making fun of you. Uh, so uh, I didn't have a physical disability like Matthew, but dancing with my feet turned out to be much harder than I thought. And people misinterpreted my problems as me being a bad learner. But I was good at learning other things, I just couldn't learn to dance very well. It was a specific kind of difficulty, but I knew when I passed people on the street, they would say to each other, oh my God, there's the kid from our class, or there's the grown-up from our class who can't learn. He's really retarded. I'm sure people said that. Anyway, this is Tim Berners-Lee, moving to the very front of the brain. Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor of the World Wide Web. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, MacArthur genius, all kinds of things like that incredibly ADHD, one of the most ADHD persons I've ever met. And um, he has an approach to the world that's different because of that. And I argue, and he allow, he, we know each other, he says it's fine to tell this story. If he wasn't ADHD, he wouldn't have invented the World Wide Web. So we all are beneficiaries of the fact that he is atypical. Because why? Because he was just aggravated by how going to a library and all that stuff took way too much time for an impulsive ADHD person. So he just wandered away. How could I find all the stuff I want to right now? No one else would think about doing that. Everybody was thinking, you should go to the library and ask the librarian. And he was, oh my God, I'd have to get in the car and go over there. I can't do that. I need it right now. So he invented the World Wide Web. Um, but uh, so anyway, we all, oh, I should say, don't you all feel like he has made you more ADHD? When you are on the web, aren't you ADHD? You can't help it. You can't read a novel on the, on the web because you're so distractible. Thanks to Tim Berners-Lee, he made you all more ADHD. Okay, what do we mean by design? Um, da -da -da, we said that. Um, I just wanna check on my time here. Okay, I'm still okay, I think. Um, New technologies allow us to do new kinds of designs in our learning environments. And I'm just gonna take a moment to show an example. Let's say we wanted to teach uh, a piece of music. Um, in this case, Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. You'll recognize it in just a second. Um, and I wanna teach kids to comprehend it or adults to comprehend it. Just playing the music is very hard 
as a beginner to understand what did Bach do? How did he construct this? What's, what are these pieces that he used to make this music great? And you wouldn't do very well at it. So you can take another representation. You can show me or you the score. For some people, that would help, people who already know music. But for many people, that wouldn't help at all. You have to be actually good at that too. So just playing it aloud orally is not enough. And even another um, sense, providing it um, visually, is probably not going to get everybody. So and this is where, I, oh good, this one is working for some reason. So I just want to show you, and I'm going to do it briefly. Wow. I don't know what happened. It was uh, started to click on and it disappeared. Oh, I don't know what happened. All my videos have disappeared. You got any idea what happened? Maybe if I escape, and start again. Oh, there it is. What did you do? Great. Here comes that same. Here comes Box to Cut and Fugue. Okay, now watch this next section. Look how easy it is to see what Bach is doing. Actually, it's hard to hear it. Okay, you get the idea. And um, I, uh, it gets even richer when you get to the fugue where this, this representation of it captures the themes in different colors. You can see them easily, and you can see what Bach is really doing with the music. And I've, uh, I often, go, when I'm going to go to a concert, I now go to these. These are, there's uh, hundreds of them on YouTube about great pieces. So you can actually understand more, what is the composer doing here? And you know what happens is you enjoy the piece more. People sometimes think, well, if I knew what the piece was, maybe I wouldn't like it. But actually, because you know more, you can hear more, and it makes the music richer, more beautiful. I recommend it. Um, what does this do? It follows a lot of the UDL principles, and I think this is too small for you to see, but you can see in little boxes, and you can, you'll learn about these kinds of things in another venue. Um, it provides multiple means of representation. It says, you yeah, know, we can use color, and we can use uh, spatial location. We can do a lot of things to show um, and provide steps by which a person could really learn what Bach is doing and comprehend the piece better, okay? And uh, I just want to make this concrete. If we chose reading instead of music, in the old way, all students had to choose the same approach. We had to work down at the bottom here, this perception. This is too far away for me to show. Um, you got to be able to see the text, for example. Second guideline up is you got to be able to decode it. You got to know the vocabulary. You got to know a whole lot of things in order to get meaning out of text. And at the top of this, you have to know background knowledge. You have to know about the Civil War, if you're reading about the Civil War, to actually understand it. So it used to be that you were bottom up. First you got to see, then you got to decode, then you got to go to some comprehension strategies, and finally you understand things. But that means that if you're blind, you can't read. It means if you're dyslexic, you can't read. What does that mean? You can't learn. So what do we call people? Learning disabled. Uh, I'm just going to skip the side effects thing. New media. What does new media do? New media provides 
alternatives, easy and rich alternatives. So we can take the same content that was in the book, put it in a digital form, and then we can immediately show it in multiple ways. We can show it in different colors or even different languages. Now it's pretty automatic. I can say, take this English and put it out as Arabic. Great if I have an Arabic student, if I have a French student, a Spanish student, whatever. I can begin to say, what is the way in which this can be represented to you? Similarly, it doesn't have to be visual. Now I can take that same content, the history book or whatever, and I can display it visually, but I can also display it on refreshable braille, de refreshable braille devices so kids can touch it who can't see. So automatically and easily, I can say, if blindness is your problem, we can still do Shakespeare because the book will uh, easily come out as braille. Or the book will talk itself aloud. This isn't a good slide to show that, but as you know, on your cell phones and on your computers, everything talks itself aloud now. So it used to be that decoding was the gateway. If you couldn't decode fluently, you couldn't read Shakespeare. Now, actually, you don't need to decode because um, the computer can do the decoding. What you need to do is comprehend, which is what we as teachers really want to get to. And you can even put out that same text as American Sign Language. So these alternatives are what um, uh, the modern technologies allow. So sometimes I like to say um, universally design, design learning technologies um, allow us to outsource the decoding, just like you outsource anything else. Say, uh, like a, like a um, uh, what's it called when you, uh, I'm having a name aphasia thing here, a calculator. <laughs> Okay, now there are great mathematicians who are terrible at simple arithmetic, and they would have before never been great mathematicians because they couldn't do simple arithmetic. Now, hey, they say, I use a calculator. And we go, okay, fine, you're a great mathematician. We don't say, oh, well, you're not really a great mathematician because you have to use a calculator. Similarly, we're going to be saying soon, um, you may not be a great decoder, but you can be a great reader. You can do Shakespeare and so on and so forth because you can outsource the decoding and it's now called audio-assisted reading. You can outsource the vocabulary. Every word can be clicked on to say, I don't know that word. You can just point at it and say, what's that word mean? So that a kid doesn't have to be blocked out because they don't have a big vocabulary. So in a UDL universe, there's lots of pathways. Um, we can get to comprehension for blind kids, for kids with dyslexia, blah, 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 those kind of things. Um, and this changes the universe in the following way that a decoding disability, just to give an example, is no longer fair or appropriate to call a learning disability. It's just a decoding disability. And um, we will, I think, stop calling kids learning disabled who have decoding difficulties or who are blind. It will feel just the same, like why would you call him learning disabled when we know if we gave him uh, a uh, technology way of reading, he would be a good reader uh, he would be able to do Shakespeare and science and geography. So we don't want to call them learning disabled. We want to call them print disabled. The fact is that print is too um, old an instrument and it requires all kinds of things of different people and uh, it's not well designed for everybody. So now, by the way, there are laws that talk about print disabilities, that schools need to provide digital versions of their textbooks for kids who have a print disability. It's a new word and it's going to dominate the intellectual atmosphere ahead. Kids uh, have print disabilities is very different than a kid who has a learning disability in terms of what you think they're doing. What do you think of doing? Getting rid of the print? Uh, not getting rid of it, providing an alternative to the print. And that's the legislation, NIMAS legislation 2008. I, I want to skip it. There it is in national law, print disabilities, first time the word was used. And I would argue schools have print disabilities. Schools are not able to teach some kids because they use print exclusively or majority of the time when they could use other things that were going to have more kids succeed. What do I mean by learning? I'm almost done. I think I'm not too bad on timing. Okay, good. Uh, I'm almost done for those of you that are eager to hear Greg and John. Um, what should the goal of learning be in a universe where there are rich alternatives for kids. And I think, and I feel it very strongly, that given that all knowledge can be put on CDs and stuff, 
putting knowledge into kids' head is not a worthwhile thing. Most of it's going to change anyway. We don't need to do that. The kids can access knowledge when they need it, and Google allows it to make it easy. But they do instead learn to master learning itself. They need to be really good learners. They need to know how to use things like Google and how to use digital books and how to look for information and so on in this rich environment, how to not get distracted on the World Wide Web. So mastery of learning itself is where we want to go. And through UDL, we are seeking to create expert learners, kids who are really good learners, but they're not going to be all the same. Individuals who, whatever their particular strengths and weaknesses, know how to learn. Now let's see, can you do that magic again where you got my video? Quick, run. Do you know what to do? Ah, what did you, you'll have to tell me later what you did. I don't know what that is. Um, let me turn it. Here's somebody who's really good at something. He's an expert learner. He is both blind and autistic. And you think, whoa, that doesn't feel like a person who can be an expert. And if you play the whole video, what he does is play the same piece in different styles. Play it in blues, play it in jazz, play it in ragtime. So he's not just echoing um, the music, he is creating styles and all of that. He is an expert learner. And here's the cr unbelievable thing. He does not read music. Why? Because he's blind. He can't see the music. So he has to learn just by listening to a piece. What the piece is, and he plays it as you can see perfectly, but he can also then transform it into other styles. This is expert learning, coming from a person who's both blind uh, and autistic. So the goal of UDL is to create more expert learners. Not to say everybody's got to be the same kind of learner, but people need to be different kinds of learners. And we'll get the, uh, I'm just going to end with a few people who are amazing, who have very frank disabilities. Dame uh, Ed Evelyn Glennie is deaf. And she's a Grammy Award-winning percussionist, plays for the London Symphony. She's fabulous. She's completely deaf. She listens with her feet. She takes her shoes off, feels the vibration in the floor, and is a symphony player. Amazing. Uh, Ludwig Beethoven, you, uh, Beethoven, you know he was deaf. Da -da -da. Uh, expert scientist, Stephen Hawking, he's just like Matthew. He has almost no physical control. Fabulous physicist. Jack Horner, a paleontologist, the guy around whom the movie um, Jurassic Park, incredibly dyslexic. He flunked all of his science classes in school. And you think, wow, how did he become a paleontologist? And the answer is because he had teachers who had him join the science, uh, the, the contests in his state for being uh, science projects. And he was fabulous. He ended up winning three years in a row the science project for his state. And yet every time he flunked general science, biology, physics. You know why? because they only used textbooks. And he was dyslexic, he couldn't learn in the textbook. That's where the textbook is the disability. He was already a paleontologist by the time he was a senior in high school, and yet he had to flunk all his courses because they were all print disabled. And lastly, artists, the one on the left is uh, autistic, the one on the right is dyslexic. They have different orientations to music. These are expert storytellers. All of these people are dyslexic. They're fabulous storytellers, why? because they didn't have to write it in text. They have, once they got out of school, they had other venues. And um, what I want to say is UDL, the intent of UDL is to create an education that is more universal, and because I like to think about music, much more musical for everyone. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Um, oh, let me, what Greg's going to set up. Can I just see if there's any questions? Uh, Greg's quick, quick changing over, uh, so Greg's going to plug his computer in. But I just want to see if there's a question that I can answer so that we don't have dead air. Anybody want to? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to come down here where I can actually hear you.
yes, there are some people who they, they are at two ends of the spectrum, typically. But there are some people who have characteristics of both. Because um, there, there's not single dimensions to us, there's multiple dimensions. But by and large, the big dimension, which is um, stimulus seeking, how much do I want new things, novel things to occur? On that dimension, ADHD kids are the exact opposite of kids with autism. They're looking for more stimulation, getting something new. Kids with autism are saying, I don't want something new, I want something regular. So they're the opposite ends of that spectrum. And by the way, kids with autism can have uh, dyslexia, kids with autism, etc. That's what some ways a lot of people diagnose them because I feel like it comes to the way a lot of people say they say well, it's ADHD and autism, so like how, but maybe it's... Can you say, say your question again so people can hear? Sure. So like, is, is there a lot of misdiagnosis going on calling kids both? Um, probably but it's largely because I think we're misdiagnosing what autism is. And I think we'll get smarter about realizing this is what autism is and this is what ADHD is. Um, Thank you. Are you ready to go, Greg? Okay, now Greg. Thank you, great question. So I talked to you in the beginning of this session around the New Hampshire Universal Design for Learning Academy. And since uh, over the past four years, the New Hampshire Department of Education has been in contract with the Center for Applied Special Technologies, CAST, to implement in over 30 schools something called Universal Design for Learning Principles. And here today is the Fall Mountain District, Greg Amend and Hi guys. John Gilbert. And they're going to talk about their journey. They've worked over three years now on implementing Universal Design for Learning. So I'm going to try to keep the mic here, and hopefully I'm not so nervous that I'm going to be shaking the podium on you guys, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so as Mary just mentioned, my name's Greg Amend, and, and this is John, and we've been working with UDL for three years now. Um, and our work today is going to center around the idea of engagement that you heard Dr. Rose talk about. Um, we're part of the Fall Mountain Regional, Regional School District, specifically Vilas Middle School, and that's located about 30 minutes north of Keene, uh, right on the Vermont border. So just really quick with engagement, right away when we jumped in a few years ago with the New Hampshire UDL Academy, our team, myself, John, we had two other colleagues with us, um, we figured that we were going to focus on engagement on our UDL journey. We felt for us that representation and action and expression, expression fell under the engagement um, umbrella. So we focused on that area. And our goal really was there was to create motivational, uh, motivated and purposeful learners. So in year one, what we decided to do is we decided to do a comprehensive literature analysis on engagement. And we kind of tailored that down a little bit. And for us, we were like, hey, you know what? Let's just get kids interested in learning. If we can get them interested in learning and interested in, with, in themselves, they're going to be engaged in the classroom. So we started studying Dr. Rose's work and some of the other work that you see up here. Maslow's work, Vygotsky, uh, Maria Montessori. And some of the stuff that I started to realize is like the work with Maslow, we learn about it as we're getting our bachelor degree for teacher certification, but we actually don't study his work. And we decided to do that. And very quickly within year one, we realized that the classroom that I've had, though it's been successful for five or six years, was really teacher-centered. That it was all about me in the classroom. That I was the one that was designing lessons, that I was the one that was assigning things, choosing the readings. I would, it even ended up blowing my mind that I was the one that was always evaluating the student instead of me asking them to evaluate themselves. So this picture that you see up here was actually created for me in 2012 by a student just to show me how cool I was. I mean, I miss these days. But look how cool I am. And our UDL journey, I think this picture speaks volumes of where we started. I'm so cool, I'm riding a dolphin. I'm watching a video about dolphins. I have dolphins fighting on my t-shirt. I'm eating a can of tuna that probably has dolphins in it. But more importantly, I am the center of this classroom. And I am the center of this picture. And you don't see students there. And that was a little bit of a harsh wake up call when I decided to use this picture for this presentation because it really rang true for me. So our UDL journey over the last three years, as you saw on that first slide, has really been about this concept for us called squish the fish. 
removing the teacher as the barrier in the classroom. Get the students engaged in themselves, in the learning process, in each other. So what we've done over the last few years, if we've, we've created a classroom model that's based on a lot of choice and a lot of co collaboration. And we focus on things like relationship with the self, relationships with other learners. And everyone in the room, whether they work in my school, that they're staff or they're visitors, is one of those learners that we build relationships with. And then learning itself. So I want to take a second just to walk you through my classroom really quickly. It's only about a two minute video. Um, if you are interested in coming out and seeing more, I'd love to have you out. We probably redesigned this classroom idea six or seven times. Uh, this video was shot two weeks ago, but recently we upgraded our furniture to have standing desks and different options for students to sit. And so you don't see that in this video, unfortunately. All right, let me see if I can get this to play. Hi everyone, this is Greg. Today I want to start this film off on quality to help you get a vibe for what it feels like walking to and into my classroom. On our way there, you'll notice a range of student-created motivational posters that lead all the way up to my door. Alright, here we are at my door. Entering. Creating a relaxing, movement, encouraging classroom environment has been an important part of my universal design for learning strategy. And I feel I've achieved that in this room. Open spaces and natural light sets the tone, and materials, supplies, and text space throughout the room encourages students to get out of their seats and move about. All right, let me show you a little bit of the room today. But if you want all the nuts and bolts of it, you're going to have to come visit. Walking around the room here, I'm going to take you through the lounge area where students hang out, they come and read, and sometimes just come to relax as they process all those different types of middle school turmoils that they face. I'm just going to continue walking around here. Once I get past the lounge area, I'll be heading into where the students sit at different tables. All right. So now I'm passing by different teamwork tables, where at any given point, students are working on different self-directed projects that coincide with the range of text complexity. Often, though, those texts are at college levels. All right, and here in this spot in the back of the room, is we have a little area for students to independently work on a project of their choice. You guys can ask me questions about the classroom in a little bit, but what I want to do for right now is I really want to return and share my thoughts of where I'm at when it comes to relationships and their role in education. So I just really want to turn back to this idea of squish the fish. Because uh, everything with this presentation kind of just fell into place once I saw that picture of me on the dolphin. Um, so much so that, does anyone know what this is from? Okay, I, I was six, all right, I'm six. This is 1985-1986 season. The Miami Dolphins play the Patriots. If the Patriots win, they go on to the Super Bowl. They do, they get crushed by the Bears. The Bears had uh, Walter Payton, Refrigerator Perry, et cetera. Okay, I remember this day. I'm six years old. And I'm gonna to talk to you how I remember that because of the relationship I had with my father. Now, we're talking six years old, guys. I have a three-year-old and a three-month-year-old at home. There was a day this week I was staring at my wardrobe wondering, it was Wednesday, I was wondering what shirt I wore to work on Monday, and I couldn't remember. I can remember something from six years old, 31 years ago for me. If you ask my wife, my beautiful wife Kristen, if she was here tonight, you could be like, hey, what did you guys talk about last night? And I'm going to be getting slapped, because I can't remember. I can't remember that. But I was so engaged in this time for two reasons. First one. It was the first time I can recall or remember my dad changed the rules of the house. And going through this UDL journey I, in this presentation, I keep thinking to myself, 
how has that impacted me as a teacher? Has that allowed me to try to change the rules of education in my classroom? Has that allowed me to change the rules um, when it comes to student variability and adjust discipline or how I approach kids? And I think it has. So what happened with the rules? My dad had two regarding dinner. One, dinner was at 5 o'clock. And two, it didn't matter where you were. You were eating at the table with the family. This game was on at 4 o'clock. He had to work that morning over time. My dad worked two or three jobs when I was little. So my dad, the night before, he puts sausage and peppers in a crock pot. I guess he turns it on, it malfunctions or whatever. I don't even know what happened there though. But I do remember the kids won. Me and my brother and sister got to choose what pizza we wanted and we got to watch in front of the game. Because the sausage and pepper turned into some nasty, sloppy Joe mix. Now the other thing that was really important about this was that if the Patriots won, the Pats went to the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl was just a couple days after my birthday. I just want to show, show you right now an example of what relationships do to scheme a building in the young's mind. I reason that if the Pats went to the Super Bowl, that I was going to have a Super Bowl birthday party. And because those things are magical, the birthday parties, well, Super Bowls too nowadays, right? I mean, but the birthday parties are so magical, I was going to blow out a candle and wish for the Pats to win. And by doing so, it was going to happen. Altruistic behavior that I felt was going to have or lead to my whole family celebrating. Pats beat the Dolphins. They went to the Super Bowl and my dreams are crushed forever. I no longer believe in blowing out candles. But the complexity of my thought based around the relationship with sports at the time and my relationship with my dad at the time. Now in the classroom, what does that do? Or what it could have done back then if my dad was an educator and he was thinking about my development along those lines or maybe my, my academic development, is fair to say. He could have had me read something like a text like this. He could have sat me down. He could have went over stat analysis, play analysis. He could have broke down previous games with the Miami Dolphins, just like uh, Bill Belichick's dad did with him at a young age. And my dad would have had me hook, hook, line, and sinker. Now, I don't think I would have known this. Half the words in this. No way. But I would have been there trying. He would have had me at the table. And that's what relationships also do in our classroom. So much so that my classroom built on relationships. Have kids reading this right now in the classroom. Actually, we just finished this, and they just finished their projects. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Last Child in the Woods. It talks about the issues that we have with kids not going outside anymore and maybe what things we can do in education to change that. I'm just going to read the first paragraph for you guys here. Maybe just the first couple lines. Though current waves of school reform are less than nature friendly, individual teachers with help from parents, natural history museums, I'm not sure what that word is. I don't know. And other volunteers can do much to improve the situation without organized official sanction. To be truly effective, however, we must be, go beyond the dedication of individual teachers and volunteers to question the assumptions and context of the gap between students and natures. Now, I did the same exact thing with the students in the classroom. I took them outside, I talked about nature. They want to do something with nature. That word that I said I didn't know, seven kids was looking up by the time I finished that second sentence. Those kids all went on to design projects of what the school could be doing to get kids back outside of nature in ways that make sense for all the curriculum and everything else the school is accountable for. The last thing about relationships I want to talk to you guys is perspectives. But I think I'm going to come down off the stage maybe. Maybe over there would probably be easiest because my laser pointer doesn't reach either. Can you guys hear me fine? I'd rather, I'd rather do this in the microphone. Anyone know what this is from? 2003, snow game at home, last game of the regular season, season. Patriots first, you're going to be amazed that this is all coming together like this, Miami Dolphins, all right, Pats win, they go on and win the 2003 Super Bowl versus the Philadelphia Eagles, I think, the Eagles, I, mean, I don't know if it followed football, the Eagles had some bad luck in the Super Bowls, okay. I want us in the audience, as well as myself, to take the role as we're the teacher, and this is our classroom. And I'm just going to walk you through my perspectives on these two scenes. First thing I want to point out, though, is these are the same exact size. 
So if I took this and I exit out of the PowerPoint and move it over, same exact, exact exercise. Now in this one, we can assume we're up close. Right? We know Teddy Bruschi a little bit better. We can see in this picture he is strong. He seems like he's in control. I mean, there's definitely some energy coming out of his group work, but everyone seems so focused on it, it seems like something's going right there. I look over here, though, and in this scene, maybe I step back. Maybe I don't know the kid as much. Maybe I just move him to the side and look at him differently. Maybe it's because I, the information I know about his parents, or the school that he came from, or pick anything. And then I look at the classroom. He doesn't seem as strong, but he definitely seems like the center of attention. I look at, if you look straight up in the snow column, there's the guy, cheesy. He's got the biggest smile on his face. That kid is goofing around. And then I don't know, this, this guy in the orange and the guy in the brown, those guys are out of their seats tossing around. I'm not liking this student right now. I'm not liking my classroom right now. Perspectives. We cut down on the angles, or we are perceived through more angles with relationships. And we have to get to the point where we're helping the student understand those relationships too, so they can see education themselves and learning differently. I do want to point out one other thing here. If you look at the snow column on this picture, you can see a guy in a white hood and the guy that's smiling right here in the middle. So in a classroom where a student can see himself, that student becomes engaged, they push himself, they are empowered. And I know that with this picture. Because that guy cheesing is my dad. And we were at this game. And he has this picture hanging up in his house. <laughs> now me, I'm the guy in the white that in that picture you can't see. And in this one, I'm hiding behind my dad. I couldn't see myself in the classroom. So you know what I did? I didn't pay attention. I didn't care. This picture is not up in my house. We don't talk about this picture, are you kidding me? I'm so thrilled right now I get to talk about this picture because I feel like this school let me down and disenfranchised me, so I'm going to raise kids that feel the same way. And I just go to school under the bus. That's what happens in education. That's what happens when the focus isn't relationships. Now all that becomes even more complex when we're talking about students with disabilities. So I know the situational irony with my presentation, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, I know it is. Here I am talking about squishing the fish, but I'm the center of the, the, center of the presentation. Look at me, listen to me. Right, I'm, I'm going to engage you guys, I'm going to ride the dolphin right now. But if you were able to get past that barrier, you would notice, yeah, this is the point. In the snow column, right in the middle, there's a dog. And I want to teach you guys about that dog. Pierce is his name, and he has a different perspective on this game and on life than most people. Our Catherine Underwood has his story. Oh, I didn't feel that sort of Isn't that impressive? Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's crazy. The 2001 Fan of the Year has been to his fair share of Patriots games. This is his tiny year. For 27 years, so that's 270 plus playoffs. But Randy Zip Pierce hasn't actually seen a game in 15 years. September 14, 2020, I'm blind, totally blind. Because of a rare neurological disease, life as he knew it had changed. You don't want to see it. You've got people on visual effects on nature. I miss that piece of work. What never changed, though, was his passion for the Patriots. The season ticket holder still made the trip to Foxborough every game, with his face painted and his steady Brucey banner. Now, with a new special guest. If you look at the front row, See my beautiful golden retriever, Austin. You see it? Austin was Pierce's first guide dog, and then there was Quinn. With Quinn, Pierce hiked the 48,000 foot peaks twice. Now Pierce has help from Autumn. You are my good girl. Because of the rain Sunday night, Autumn stayed home for the AFC Championship. But sure enough, Pierce was there, experiencing the game in a way more people should. But in football, we don't need people with crowd energy. I hear hits. I heard the fellows catch for the ball in his hands last week. I heard the fellows catch. Just 
Just think about that and we think about the fell as a student in the classroom. And we're thinking about how in education, how in our rooms at any given moment, everyone, including the teacher or the visitor or the administrator, is experiencing it differently. And just think about what that means in terms of relationships, and how relationships can be the gateway to engagement in the classroom. So let's go do it for my part. And I'm going to have John come up here. And John is our data guru. Because everything we do in the classroom, we're also tying data into our decisions. John? I feel a little comfort when I have it in my hand, I suppose. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about our timeline and how we learn to use data to track what we're doing because, of course, one big question we have whenever we're looking at stuff like this is, is how effective is it? Um, and so it became a real challenge when Greg told us that we were doing uh, engagement. Um, my first challenge was figuring out exactly how are we to track the data on engagement, what exactly should we use to measure engagement, and it even started with what is engagement to begin with? What is our definition of engagement? And we, we went through a few um, revisions in, in that fact as well. Uh, we, we looked a little bit about um, interest and reading interest, specifically since it's a literature classroom. Um, but reading interest was a big deal for us. We felt like that could give us a good picture into the overall engagement into a literature classroom. So um, one of the first things we started doing was looking at some of our uh, NWA um, maps data. And there's a lot on here, but really what I want you to focus on here is we chose several uh, cohorts, groups of students, uh, and I did some historical data mining, um, pulled up some information, and just put it together in a simple graph. Our focus group, can you guess which one it is? It's the red line. Um, now, it doesn't seem really stark. I mean, it's red, so it stands out more. but. One thing that I take note of with that particular line is that where all the other lines dip down over the summers, that one doesn't. It stays steady on an upward climb. Um, and what that means for us, I think it's still a little you know, early to say exactly, but I think it's a positive um, piece of information that's encouraging to us that what we're doing is, is in fact um, effective. Uh, one, another thing that we did was we, we did a reading attitude assessment. We wanted to see what our students' attitudes towards reading was. Um, it was somewhat surprising here that the library cluster came out in the highest, so it, it sort of topped us, um, topped out, and, and it showed us that our students, while we didn't think so, were actually using the library quite often, uh, and that even led us to digging deeper uh, into the local library circulation statistics and then eventually started um, using that to connect to what I'll talk about in a little bit and that's our, our um, community outreach piece of our UDL implementation. Um, we also did something that I, I dug up um, called the student engagement instrument. I modified it slightly, I changed it into a Google form so that it was easier for the students to, um, to access. Um, uh, other ways that we could have done it, we could have read it to the students or um, had it read to the students using technology that we actually have. Um, but at this time, we, we went ahead and had the students do it independently. Um, and basically what this showed us was our students were actually, based on this, more engaged than we were anticipating. Um, so either that's because they're better at reporting about themselves, what their engagement is, uh, or that's because our perception of what their engagement is was very different, and that it could be either way. Um, uh, uh, highest is a four, sorry, it's a one to four. Um, so some of the surprises we had, I've already talked a little bit about, we, we started off with um, reading logs, we were tra tracking student reading, um, and we, we made sort of a hypothesis that, you know, if, if we were able to track our students reading beyond the required amount, then that would give us some indication of what their level of engagement with their reading is. Well, we ran into a couple of problems. First of all, students weren't actually logging the hours beyond the required amount. So that kind of threw that out the window somewhat. Um, and also, as far as tracking the data, we, we noticed that all the same kids' names kept coming through. So it was always the same kids that were doing the assignment over and over and over again. We felt like it wasn't really valid. So that led us to some other methods, such as with the SEI, the Student Engagement Instrument. Um, and the Student Engagement Instrument, 
two pieces of information that we got out of that was the highest score was the student's uh, control and relevance of work, which basically says that they, when, when they do their work, they understand the connection of their work to their achievement levels in the classroom, which is, that's great, that's wonderful, we like to hear that. Um, the lowest, however, was their future planning and goal setting. Um, so, yeah, sure, they, they understand how their work connects to what they're doing in the here and now, but they need to be bridged to this whole long-term planning and what is my future actually looking like. So that's opened up some avenues for us to have conversations with the students and work on how do we bridge that gap. And part of that might be through our, our literacy um, piece. Um, I've already talked about the, the roadie reading and how it connected to our library statistics um, and how we were able to access some population records from the library uh, and are still looking at those. We actually haven't gotten fully into those yet, but uh, a lot of those library records show that the predominant use of the library is with kids such as um, the, the early readers and some of the early fiction uh, chapter books, which is kind of interesting. One of the highest growing categories is the interlibrary loan category, um, which is exciting to me because that's showing us that, that people are learning how to access materials from other libraries through their local library. Um, my wife being a librarian, I'm kind of partial to that kind of activity. Um, eventually, we found our way doing um, this student survey. We, we decided that we really wanted to see what our students' voice actually was. We wanted to know what, what are our students saying about what they're doing in the classroom. So we asked three simple questions, not really questions, but we had three simple um, prompts to guide them in their, in their thinking. So the first one deals with attitude, the second one deals with the relationships piece, and then the third one deals with their choices in the classroom, the ability to make choices. So the attitude portion of it came out pretty much positive. I did like a quick um, coding analysis on the, the, on the, I counted up the positive words and the negative words and then divided. So I got 85% uh, roughly were positive, positive um, phrases. And most of these are, in fact, I think all of these are positive phrases. I'll give you a second just to look at a couple of them. They have a good feeling about the classroom. They feel great when they come in. Um, Greg's got some nice routine built in where the students come in and do some um, reflecting and sort of calming before they start their work, sort of a way to erase whatever was going on in a previous class or the previous part of the day, uh, which we find is very important, and they even found it very important as whenever it's forgotten, they don't like it. So they, they want to make sure that piece is there. Um, as far as relationships, it got a little bit messed up here, I think, probably in just the resizing, but as far as the relationships, they do like working together for the most part, but not all the, all the time. So Greg has a spot in the classroom, and there are other spots that they can work individually. They'd like to work individually, so group work isn't necessarily mandatory. Uh, depends on what the task or the goal actually is. Um, but one of my favorite quotes is the one at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it, but it just says, some people are persistent with their ideas even when they're not as good as others. So when you're, when you're thinking about relationships, and that being one of our biggest focuses, this tells you that they're aware of each other, they're aware of each other's ideas, they're willing to share and accept each other's ideas, um, but they're not always completely bought into to each other's ideas. Um, and that, to me, that's fine because you're at least opening up a doorway for them to communicate ideas with each other. The last one, of course, is choice, uh, which is another key component to what Greg offers in his classroom. Um, they love the ability to choose, but this particular question deals more with their ability to plan a project. Um, I love, uh, on the previous slide, I forgot to mention, one of them um, talks about how in a team they like to look at who they have in their team and then use their skills accordingly. So clearly we have some individuals that come out as kind of the leaders of the group um, and then assign them different work. So, and then that comes out in the choices because you've got some groups that dive right in, I don't want to do any planning, I just want to get going. Uh, you have others that sort of sit back, and, and this is more like me, sort of eyeball the situation, figure out what's going on, and then sort of slowly work my way in. Then there are others who take charge and say, you're doing this, you're doing this, and you're doing this. Uh, and of course, everybody is very compliant. They're, they're more than willing to do so, uh, unless you have another leader in the group, and that can you know, be kind of interesting to, to see play out, but they're very respectful of each other in that way as well. 
So I, I know I'm moving quickly through it because you know I'm, I'm trying to you know be aware of time and all that. So the last thing I want to talk about is just what what is our next steps? What does this all mean? There's a lot of information that we've gotten in our surveys. We're going to continue working with those surveys as we move forward um, with our work in UDL. Um, but some of the important things are the community relationships, even between the school as well as reaching out into our, our local community, such as the library, and bringing some parents in. So you can see on our list of things, it looks like maybe the bottom one got cut off. Um, and I think that just talks about something general, just talking about um, meeting with our cohorts and, and having our regular meetings with our parents and our community and our students. But the second one up here is the Reading Buddies program. This is something that we started, I believe it was the beginning of this year. Uh, and what that is, is the middle schoolers have an opportunity uh, on a schedule. They, we have to time it out because, you know, time is very, very tight in schools these days. Um, and they come over to our, our primary building uh, and the older kids in the, the middle school are able to read with our primary kids. And both groups absolutely love it. The teachers absolutely love it. Uh, and they, they look forward and get excited about it every time they come over. So we're, we're trying to make that connection, helping them understand um, the importance of reading. The middle schoolers, seeing the excitement in the little, the younger primary kids' eyes, where they're still very excited about reading and learning. Uh, and then the other way around, of course, is seeing, you know, we're going to some really, really hard stuff, and we're going into some very different things in the middle school, and life is very different in the middle school. Um, so we want to we wanna develop a digital portfolio. We're, we're kind of working on it. It's a work in progress, um, a way of tracking student work as a form of a grading system. We want to build a menu of assignments. We've described it somewhat of as uh, almost like a scavenger hunt, or I think Greg's used the term uh, choose your own adventure. Uh, kind of set up where one task might lead to choices for multiple other tasks and then again branching off into different directions uh, and then even those tasks might be tiered you know so for instance they might go to a library your first task is simply just to go check out you know, get a, a library card from the library or something like that uh, and then the next task might elevate that okay now that you know where the library is and what a library card is now let's go in and use that library card to access information that you need for a project that you're working on or something like that. Um, we want to expand our UD element implementation. We've started doing that this year, but we want to really kind of redouble our efforts in this this year, or next year rather. Um, I believe our writing teacher at the middle school is looking to maybe take um, charge of a group as uh, maybe a leader of our next cohort. Um, possibly, I think we're still ironing out the details on that, but um, she's very excited about the whole universal design, uh, design um, process and has been integral in our part in the past couple of years as well. And of course, there's a natural connection between literacy and writing, uh, and hopefully there'll be some partnered activities where the students are doing, you're bridging the two classrooms doing projects and activities that are connected in some way. Uh, and then one of the big things that we, we brought up in our last um, meeting with our cohorts was this idea of a family literacy night. I know I've done them in the past at other, at other schools where I've worked, uh, and I've seen some really good successes and some not so good successes. Um, we'll talk about it later, but I think some of the, the, the best ways to get people to show up is free food and live animals. Those, those were the two that got us really big turnouts for a couple of our literacy nights. We'll have to put that one on the, you know, on the list of things to do. Um, other than that, we just plan on continuing our work with UDL through the state and through our, uh, our work with CAST, um, as well as having regular meetings with um, our families, our community, uh, and even involving our students. We would love to have had students even come to a venue like this and see what we're doing as educators or one of our CAST meetings to see what we're doing uh, and how that applies to them. And I think that we can learn from them as far as you know, what they're looking for. Uh, in school. So that's all I have. Well, thank you for coming out this evening. As you can see, this is the beginning and continued journey of implementing universal design for learning. In New Hampshire, the State Department of Education has submitted a draft 
Every Student Succeeds Act. Embedded in that draft is a state universal design for learning plan. I can see some nods. We're asking for feedback. Um, we really, really are so excited around the leadership at the state to really work in the schools. And it's different in every school. I'm looking out and I see Hudson and I see Strong Foundation. I see lots of schools that are either beginning the journey or are really moving towards some more implementation. So my point to you this evening is welcome to the journey. Please stay tuned for us. The Office of Student Wellness and the Bureau of Special Education will continue to feed you some information with regards to and make and allowing you to be part and engaged in this process. Thank you.